Well, good morning once again. Today I'm going to take a look at all the tools used in spindle work. I'm going to highlight the tools. I'm going to do a little cutting with each one of them. And at the end of the video, I'm going to do some sharpening on each one of the tools I use in the video. So let's get started. All right, now I'm going to take a look at the spindle roughing gouge first. I think this tool is one of the most overlooked tools. I think it's very versatile. I use this for a lot of different operations. And mainly, it's very good for taking off square corners and making a round blank. Now as I begin making some cuts on this square blank with my spindle roughing gouge, I'm going to give you fair warning that this video is going to be rather long. I'm going to go into a lot of detail on these different tools and at the end I'll do a little bit of sharpening. But right now I'm just focusing on making some nice cuts and I'm not going to do a lot of uh, speeding up of these clips. I'm going to try to keep a lot of these in real time to give you a sense of what I'm doing and how I'm making these cuts. Now you're looking at uh, my favorite spindle roughing gouge. This is a tool I get from Packard Woodworks. And I really like the size. I don't always need an enormous spindle roughing gouge. This just works perfectly. Now as I go through this video and show you different tools, I will show you different angles. I think it's important to see what I'm doing from a couple different perspectives. So right now I'm just taking this all the way down and one orientation of this tool I really like is right here where I've got that mostly on its side with the flute closed and that wing is a little bit straighter than the bottom of the tool and it gives me a very nice cylinder. Okay, now I rough that down rather quickly and I've got some grooves and imperfections in that and if you really want to get a little bit better cut with the spindle roughing gouge, I'm going to hold that on its side a little bit more in that orientation. So let's just take another cut and I'm turning about 2500 RPM. Now I can feel the difference and I can see the difference from right here to this part of this blank. Now in this last little bit I was cutting. I had the bevel rubbing in a proper orientation and I was cutting. So let's move on to the next tool. All right, now I'm gonna take my spindle gouge and I'm gonna just face off this end of this little piece of wood I've got in there. I'm going to line my bevel up in the direction I'm cutting. So that's the position I need that when I start that cut. Now that did a pretty good job. I didn't get that little uh, center hole I had in there. Let's make another cut. That's pretty clean. Let me show you one more angle with the same cut. 
Now this is a little bit better angle showing the orientation of my bevel. My bevel is pointing in the direction I am cutting. Now you'll notice at the very end of this cut, I close my flute up right here. Okay, that's a pretty clean cut. While I'm here at the end grain of this little blank, I'm going to do a chamfer, which is just a straight cut. Now I think the key to making this particular cut is to put some pressure down into the tool rest with the tool and all I'm doing is just pushing straight forward with my tool and I get a straight cut and that's a chamfer. Let me show you one more angle with that. Okay, let's take a look at that. Very nice clean cut. And by the way, I'm using alder. It's a pretty soft wood and even though I'm getting a very nice finish off that. And this might be the cut that you make when you're making a top. Now I thought while I'm here at this setup I would use my diamond shaped parting tool a little bit and just face this off and square up the end of this blank. Now that left a really ragged surface there. I really don't care at this point. I'm going to take my spindle gouge and do a round over cut. Half of a bead on the end of this little blank of wood. Now I was getting some really, really nice shavings off that, little curly cues. Now you'll notice at the end of my cut, I left this little nub of wood right here. Sometimes when you cut this off completely, it leaves a little hole in the wood and you're better off sanding that off. And that just doesn't take much. And that's a little 180 grit and that took that right off and there's no hole in the end of that. So that's half of a bead. Okay here's the same cut with my spindle gouge at a little different angle. Now I believe the key to making this particular cut, this round over, is not at the cutting end of your tool. It's back here at the end of my handle. And what I'm doing 
is I'm just swinging an arc until I make that cut. And the smoother I use this end of the tool and just make, make a nice arc with it, that transfers into a nice cut here. Now I have just a little bit of wood left. I have just enough wood to make a lamb's tongue. In a recent video I did that and I want to take a little bit more time explaining this. Traditionally a lamb's tongue was found in furniture or in moldings. And basically if you look at the pictures I'm showing you right now, a lamb's tongue is simply an OG shape. It's a curve that goes in one direction and then changes direction. So I have a concave and a convex form in this turning. Right here I'm going to make a cove. It's going to be concave and then convex. And that's a lamb's tongue. Now that's a good beginning, but I need to go down a little bit deeper right in this area. Now I'm putting a little piece of paper right down here so I can see this. I'm having a little trouble seeing the profile of that when it's spinning. There's my lamb's tongue. Now here's another look at this detail of a lamb's tongue. And I'm probably not using this correctly. This is an element that's traditionally uh, carved out with a mallet and a chisel. But anyway, let's move on. Now I have a piece of alder in my chuck, safely between some long nose jaws and the tailstock. And I'm going to make some cuts with a spindle gouge first. And then I'm going to go to a detail gouge and my vortex tool. First cut I'm going to make is a V cut. And I'm turning around 3000 RPM and I'm wearing my face shield right there. Now as I make this V cut, you'll notice that my tool is completely closed. The flute is turned over on its side. And this is important because as you make that cut and you're down at the bottom of the V, the other wing of your tool will catch on the opposite side of the V cut. And I just go from side to side, making it deeper and deeper. And right now I'm making the point that with a spindle gouge I can only make that V cut so sharp. And then we'll move on to some other tools and make the same cut. Now the idea for making a V cut like this is making a very, very narrow cut. And I can only make that so narrow with my spindle gouge. This is ground to maybe uh, 40 degrees. And I can only get in there so much. And at the very end of that cut, I want my flute completely closed right here. If it's open, this opposite wing is going to catch that area right there. I'm going to get a, a catch. So let's go to the next tool we might use here. Let's see if we can make this a little sharper angle going down in there. This is my uh, detail gouge. And this is a Robert Sorby tool. It's a 10 millimeter or 3 eighths. And what I like to do is I like to measure the thickness right here. Because uh, in England and in Europe they may measure that a little differently than what we do. So let's go ahead and make that angle a little sharper. I think I'll leave that one here and I'm going to do another one right over here. So I've drawn in with a pencil 
how wide I want my V cut. But it's important to understand that I can't take all that wood out with one big cut. So I'm going to start at the very center and go from side to side and get deeper with that. And let's see how much sharper we can get with our detail gouge. Now as I make this cut, there is a common theme whether you are making a V-cut, a bead, or a cove, or any other number of cuts, you can't do the entire profile all at once. As you see here, I'm just nibbling away at this, going from side to side with my detail gouge. And this provides a very clean cut and a lot of control for your tool. All right, <laughs> I think you can see how much sharper that V-cut is than the one I did with the spindle gouge. Now let's make this one even deeper and sharper with the vortex tool. Now here's my vortex tool, and it's ground to maybe a 20 or 25 degree angle. And it is a scraping tool. The top of that is just flat. And I like to just take a diamond hone on the top of that tool and sharpen it that way. And then the rest of that tool is sharpened on my CBN wheel. Very, very sharp. Now you'll notice when I'm making this cut that the approach is really the same whether I am using my spindle gouge, the detail gouge, or in this case the vortex tool, but I can get into a really, really narrow spot with this tool. Now, oh, that's pretty amazing. And when I would use this tool, I might be turning a finial or doing some other very, very fine work. And this tool is pretty easy to make. This actually is um, a spindle gouge with a very, very shallow flute, and I just made it into a vortex tool. And a couple people that I think have really popularized a Vortex tool, Cindy Drozda and Stuart Batty. I'm going to continue with my spindle work project, looking at some tools. And I'm still working a little bit more on the spindle gouge. I'm going to do a cove and a bead. So here we go. Alright, that's a pretty good cove. I'm going to change my camera angle and show you something a little bit more about tool placement on this. Now in this perspective, I'm going to show you my tool handle as I make this cove cut. And I'm going to show you how it moves during that operation. And you'll see at the very end of my cut, I lower my tool handle. And what that does, it disengages the cutting edge from the cove and I stop cutting at the very bottom of my cove.
All right, I had to take a couple more cuts to clean that cove up, but that's how it's done. Now, let's move on to a bead. Now, I've set up this area on this little blank of wood to cut a bead. And I've taken my parting tool and just made a recess on either side of that bead. And I'm going to just turn that down to that level. All right, let's turn a bead with a spindle gouge. Now, one of the first things I do when I'm turning a bead is I'm going to put a pencil line right in the center of this bead right here. One of the problems with turning a bead is sometimes you end up with a very pointy top on that bead. And having a pencil line there uh, kind of guarantees or helps you not to turn that away. So I'm going to leave that on there and I'm going to go from side to side. And this cut is just the opposite of turning a cove. I'm going to start with the bevel completely open and then round it over and turn my bead from side to side. I'm just about done with my bead. I've almost completed it. I need to do a little bit more here and on the top. And you'll notice at the very bottom of my cut, I want my flute completely closed. So I'm going from open to a closed position. Let me finish up this bead. Now that's not a bad bead. <laughs> okay, now that's a pretty good job of that. And all I need to do is take a little bit of sandpaper and clean off that pencil line and we'll be done with that bead. Let me just do that real quick. Now I'm not sure if I need to take the time to do a bead with a spindle detail gouge. It's basically the same thing. I suppose you'd use this tool if you had a much smaller bead. Let's move on to something else. Now I just put a sharpener on a couple of these tools so you might hear my grinder ramping down. I'm going to show you four parting tools. This is a beading and parting tool. And I would not part a piece of wood off with this because it's a quarter of an inch um, in cross section. It would take off too much wood. I might turn a bead with it. And we can do that at the very end of this little blank. Okay, well that's half of a bead anyway, but you get the idea. Um, a beading and parting tool. This tool is used largely for shaping or doing a little bit of uh, detail work. So, beading and parting tool. Let's put that one up and we'll go to the next uh, largest size. This is a diamond parting tool. It's called a diamond parting tool because the very center of the tool this way is wider. 
and your cutting edge needs to be right along that line. And I see mine isn't lined up very well, but that's another tool I probably wouldn't do any parting with. I might do a, a little bit of detail work with this. And honestly, I don't use this tool all that much. I'm getting smaller and smaller. So here's my, probably my favorite. Let me try to get that in there. This is a Robert Sorby tool, I'm sure. Eighth of an inch in cross section. I would do a little bit of parting with this. But also it's very good for maybe the end of a, a piece of wood. Let's just do a little bit of turning here. Alright, you get the idea now as I made that cut I turned the tool on its side and just made a little spigot. So that's a very good tool for that sort of thing. And I really like this tool. Now here's another very, very nice tool. All right, now let's take a look at this tool. This is a very nice parting tool. And it's very thin. And I ordinarily don't put this on my grinding wheel, my CBN wheel. I sharpen this with a diamond hone. And that works very well. I tend to mess up parting tools and I try to keep that nice grind on there. So let's take a look at a couple cuts with parting tools. We'll just do a little bit of a demonstration with some parting tools here. And I've got this very small one. Uh, let's just part this off completely. Okay, now what I've done is I've gone down to maybe a couple millimeters, probably less than an eighth of an inch. I'm going to back the tailstock off. I could probably just tear that off, but if I'm doing some sort of a project, I may not want a hole in the end grain of this. So I'll just continue. This is safer backing off the tailstock. There we go. Now another thing you can do while you're parting something off is make a little bit wider kerf. What I've done with that tool is I've just widened that, probably uh, double the thickness of this parting tool, and I'm down to just uh, a millimeter. Oop. There we go. Accidentally bumped it, and there's my little piece. Let's go to another parting tool, I'll just show you something else. Now, from that angle, Let's say I'm making some sort of a detail on a piece, but I don't want a lot of torn grain. If I start with the tool way up here and I move the cutting edge down and the tool handle up, I may get some torn grain. Let's see what happens there. Okay, now you see the torn grain? Now I learned this from uh, an Alan Batty video. I'm going to just clean that up. Alan Batty made the point that if you want a clean entry in that cut, to start with your tool horizontal. Don't start it up here, but start it down here. Let's see what happens. Now, 
I've got a little bit of torn grain there, but for the most part, that's really clean. I can't explain why that is, but if you want a clean cut with that parting tool, start it in a horizontal orientation. Okay, now here's the beading and parting tool I showed you a little bit earlier. I'm not going to do a whole lot with this. This beading and parting tool is a scraping tool for the most part. If you hold it up here, it's cutting, but it's a negative rake scraper if you look at the cross section. Or it's a skew chisel. It's very narrow in this dimension and very tall in this dimension. It's the first cousin to the English and the French bedan, in my opinion. Some people may <clears throat> disagree with that. But anyway, I use this tool mainly for detailing. I'm not going to take that much off and do a, a parting cut on a lidded container. Now here's another view of this bead cut on the very end. Now I had a very firm grip on that tool because that tends to roll back on you and cut back in the other direction. Now I think the most basic cut you can make with a skew chisel is a peeling cut. And I've got the tool 90 degrees to the work and I'm just going to peel that wood away. Let's just take a look at that. And I'm going to have the lay speed up fairly high on this. It's really a pretty simple operation and I've got a fairly good finish off that, but I can certainly improve that by doing a planing cut with my tool held at an angle like this. So let's just take down the rest of this uh, square blank to round. Okay, now I have the camera backed off a little bit more for this shot and I want you to see what I'm doing with my tool handle. As I make this cut, my tool handle is being lifted up. And finally, this is just some evidence of a peel cut. I'm taking off a lot of wood there. And this is proof that I'm not really getting a very good surface on this. Okay, I'm going to do a little cutting with a skew chisel. I'm going to, first of all, level this surface off. Now, I'm going to mention a couple of wood turners, Mike Darlow and Eric Lostrom. Mike Darlow has a two DVD uh, set on the skew chisel and it is excellent. Eric Lofstrom, if you go to his website ericlofstrom.com and search around, he's got some instructional uh, handouts and they are absolutely phenomenal. And he shows the peel and cut, the planing cut, uh, the pairing cut and V's and he's just awesome. I've seen him in demonstrations and he's really amazing. All right, now I was just kind of planing that off. That really is a cut. Let me show you something with my skew chisel here. And you can level off a surface in a couple different ways. This is the short point of the tool, and you can certainly do it this way. And there's the shaving you get off that little curly cue, very fine little shaving. Now with the tool perpendicular to the wood and the cutting edge in this orientation, this is really a peeling cut. It's probably the most basic cut you're going to get with a skew chisel and maybe the safest cut. But as you see from the shavings I'm getting off here, so I want to be in this orientation 
right here. And again, you can see the shaving I get off that. Let me do that again. Right there. Now, short point leading, long point leading. Let me make a cut, first of all, like that. To the long point leading. thing I notice as I make that cut, you can see where the dust is on that tool. It's on the lower third. If I get up here too high, I'm going to get a dig in. I'm going to get a catch. So that's a pretty good surface right there. And you can certainly do the same thing with the short point down and leading. That still is a very good surface right there. Now let's make a V cut. I know what you're thinking. When I first started that cut, let me show you that cut again. I took my cutting edge and put it on the surface and lifted the handle and I made a groove. Now that is really an accepted way to do this, to start a V-cut. And one of the favorite people I watch for skew chisel work is Mike Darlow. Mike Darlow has a two DVD set out on using a skew chisel and it's excellent. Let's do that one more time real fast. And it's also important that at the very end of that cut that your tool be vertical and not angled like that because you may get a catch on the opposite side. Okay, let's do a bead. Now if I'm really going to make a bead, I'm probably going to use a smaller skew chisel. So I've gone to one that's probably, this is probably a half inch or a five eighths inch skew chisel this way. It's a Henry Taylor tool. I really like that. So let me do just half of a bead right here. I didn't have to do any fancy editing. I uh, made four or five cuts there and I didn't get a catch. And that's pretty good. I was leading with the point of that tool. I was using the short point, not the long point. You can certainly use the long point. 
If you use the long point, that gives you a better sight to your cutting area. Now let's do the other side of this bead. Well, I apologize. I'm not giving you a very good camera angle for this cut on the left side of this bead. But I'm not getting a run back or a catch, so I guess it's working. And one point I need to make that's very important. When you end up at the end of your cut, either on the left side or the right side, you need to have your tool vertical or else you may get a catch. <clears throat> All right, now, when you're turning a bead like this with a, a tool that's difficult to use and a little scary, you'll find that you have a better um, sense of cutting that on one side. And for me, it's cutting the right side. I do that more naturally. On the other side, I don't have quite a good uh, sense of what I'm doing. So I need a little practice on that, but that's a pretty good bead with a skew chisel. I'm going to do one more thing here very quickly. I'm going to do a cove. And you can do a cove with the skew chisel. You know, I don't know if you really need to, but you can and it's good practice. Now to show you how I make this cut, I've drawn the two pencil lines and I'm starting in the middle. And that's an important thing. So you can't take off too much wood with any tool. So just little by little I'm going from the center and I'm working my way out toward the pencil lines. And this is really not that difficult a cut to make. It helps if your skew chisel's cutting edge is a little bit convex. And that keeps the points away from the wood and helps prevent getting a catch. But as you see, if I can do it, it's not that hard. And just try it. Practice. Put up a green limb and just uh, get that skew chisel out and practice, practice, practice. <clears throat> All right, now I can see the only reason to do this particular detail with a skew chisel is because it leaves an amazing surface. And uh, you can probably do it a whole lot faster with a spindle gouge, but you can do it with a skew chisel if it's in your hand. Well, this last little bit with the skew chisel, I thought I would take this bead and destroy it, and make a captured ring out of it. Here I'm doing a paring cut. And I'll just go from side to side with a paring cut. Now it's important that the top edge of your tool does not contact the wood. And in just a second, I'm going to stop this video and show you exactly what I'm talking about. Now the long point of the tool is down and leading and making the cut. And the short point, I'm making sure I keep that away from the edge of the wood. Because I'll get a nasty catch if I do that. So I will continue to narrow this little bit of wood with the paring cut and make it... Uh, smaller and smaller. And now I'm going to attempt a paring cut. Now in the next few clips I'm going to give you different uh, angles of a paring cut. Here's an end view of this paring cut and I've got the point, well, I guess I had a little catch right there, so I'm going to clean that up. That entry cut is really the most difficult part of that. Oh, here we go again. So I got that cleaned up, and I need to make sure my point is into the wood right about here. And I want to make sure the top of that tool is slightly angled away from the cutting edge. If we get too close with that, I'm going to get a real nasty catch. And we'll try it again right here. 
You'll notice my left forefinger is under the tool rest, which puts pressure down into the tool rest with my tool. All right, I'm at my CBN wheel grinder station. Let's do a little sharpening. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail on sharpening. I've got sharpening videos on spindle tools, on parting tools, uh, probably every tool you can think of, including bowl gouges. I've got sharpening videos that go into a lot more detail. But just let me give you an idea of how I do this. Now I'm going to sharpen four tools. I'm going to sharpen a spindle gouge. I'm going to sharpen a detail gouge. I'm going to sharpen my beading and parting tool. And I'm also going to sharpen the vortex tool. So let's get started with the spindle gouge. This is a D-way tool. And I'm going to take the steel out of the handle. That makes it a little bit easier. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in my one-way uh, jig. I've got this set up at two inches to the to the tip. All right, so I've got my V arm on my one-way jig set up. I'm going to take a look at this from the side. And that looks really good right there. Now what I'm aiming for is about 40 degrees. And I've got a couple tools. This, is, this particular little tool right here is uh, from Ron Brown. And it's really cool. A cool tool. I use it all the time. I'm going to just find 40 degrees. Here it is. And just check this. And I'll tell you what, that's right on 40 degrees. So I want to keep that at that angle. So let's do a little sharpening. This is pretty simple. It takes a while for that grinder to slow down. Anyway, <clears throat> take this out of the jig. And one comment about this jig, you can change the angle down here. And I'm experimenting a little bit with that. If I go down in this area, I think it's 22 degrees, I use that for a long grind on my wing. Here, I bring it all the way up, and I use this for my spindle gouges. If you have one of these, experiment with it, play around with it, and see what works for you. So there is the cutting edge on my spindle gouge. And what I will do, I'll come back periodically and make this pretty. And in the meantime, I just come back and I sharpen this by hand on my wheel. And one good tip is, I want to look down on this. I can really see that cutting edge in the bevel and I go from side to side by hand. After four or five times doing that it gets a little ugly so I go back to my jig. Let's pick another tool. Now I'm going to lump a couple tools together here. I'm going to sharpen my beading and parting tool and I'm also going to sharpen whoops and I'm also going to sharpen a skew chisel. Because really they're, they're very much the same. And I sharpen both these on my platform. Ordinarily if I use my V arm, which I don't know if you can see it here, sometimes my tool handle is too long and it puts this tool too far down on the wheel and that's dangerous. So I just use this, that's really all you need to do. I'm gonna line this up. Accidentally got it right on the money and my platform is set right for this tool. Let's do a little sharpening. Very simple. Uh... 
Okay, beading and parting tool, it's as simple as that. I put that square onto my platform. I want a square cutting edge on that. I don't want any kind of a angle. Put pressure down into the platform and I sharpen the tool. Now, same thing with the skew chisel right here. If I want a little bit of a convex curve on the very tip of that, I just simply swing my handle a little bit. If I want it just straight across, I hold it in one position. And sharpen that a little bit. Okay, so there is my skew chisel. And I had to adjust my platform just a little bit. The angle on my skew chisels is pretty much 30 degrees for the included angle. That means 15 degrees here and 15 degrees here in this bevel. Pretty sharp. And if you get a catch, it's going to be a doozy. Let me set up for my vortex tool now. Okay, now I have a couple tools left to sharpen. Um, I've got my Vortex tool set up, and I've got that in the V-arm of my one-way system. And that's a really good sharpening system. Anyway, this angle on this tool is about 20 or 25 degrees. Let me check that. Now, this, this tool is actually right at 25 degrees. And that's a pretty sharp angle. So all I do, I'm going to turn my graining wheel on and just kind of rotate that from side to side. And then the top of that, as I mentioned when I was turning, I take a diamond hone and just flatten that off. Um. Now, I took advantage of the setup to go ahead and sharpen my spindle gouge, which is done pretty much the same way. And what I do at the very end of that is I make sure these corners are taken off. So I just do that a little bit by hand. Well, there's much more to sharpening than what I just showed you in the last few clips. Much, much more. But it gives you an idea what to do when you're sharpening these tools. I'll give you a close up of these tools probably at the beginning of the video. This has been a long video. It's taken me about three days to make it, but I think there's a lot of good information in here and hopefully some good shots of cutting beads and coves and whatever with these tools. Be safe, wear your face shield all the time, and I will talk to you next time. Thank you very much. And if you're here at the very end of this, thanks a lot, I appreciate it. I'll talk to you next time.